Okay, so in this video we're going to be looking at um, binomial distribution, but finding the uh, parameters if they are what's unknown. So if n is unknown or if p is unknown. Um, some examples where we might be asked to do this and how we would go about doing that. So let's first of all think about finding p. Um, it's a little bit simpler. Um, so let's use the following example. So the probability of winning a prize in a game of chance is p. So we don't know what the probability of winning in this game is. It's found that the probability of winning at least three times is equal to 0.8 if the game is played 10 times. Find the value of p correct to two decimal places. Okay, so in when we're working with the binomial distribution, the setup is really important. So what is your variable um, representing and how is it distributed? So in this case, we're going to let w equal the number of times a prize is won. And w is binomially distributed where n is 10 and p is unknown. So uh, we can represent that in this notation. <coughs> we wish to find p such that, now we know the probability of winning at least three times is equal to 0.8. So the probability that w is greater than or equal to three is equal to 0.8. So this is important in terms of this question, the setup, what's the variable and how is it distributed? This is important in terms of that's the, that's the equation we're solving to find what p is, and then we should be able to use our CAS to find what p is, okay? Um, so at least a two mark question, possibly a three mark question. Um, so in this case, we can just use the CAS to solve an equation involving binom PDF or binom CDF. So in this case, we literally want it to solve that equation. So menu three one to solve, menu five five, B for binom CDF, because we're looking at a cumulative probability, um, W being bigger than or equal to 3, not just equal to a particular value. Um, and then our number of trials is 10. Our probability of success P is unknown, so I'm just going to put a variable in there. Um, my lower bound is 3, greater than or equal to 3, and in this case my upper bound is 10. We see those will vary depending on your problem. Now it won't like the fact that I've put a variable in one of these boxes. It'll say too few arguments, there's things missing, don't know, that's okay, but it's given me what I want. Um, binom PDF uh, 10P310, uh, that is the CAS's way of talking about that. Okay, so we would never write that CAS syntax down on the paper. That is the CAS's way of saying, here's your that and that. Okay. Um, so, and we want that to be equal to 0.8. So equals 0.8, and we're going to be solving that for p. Now, if we press enter here, it won't like it. It'll just give us back the same equation. But all we need to do is give it a domain for p. So strictly speaking, p is a probability. So we know that it's going to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so given that, remember outside of the solve function when you're adding a restriction, we do this when we're doing our trig functions, given that p is less than or equal to 0 um, or less than or equal to 1, it, in most problems um, you're not going to be dealing with the impossible or a certain situation, so you can probably just go with less than, um, should give you the same thing. Um, and we get our probability. Now what you would actually find is you actually don't even need the full um, restriction it is perfect, it is more than sufficient just to say that p has to be bigger than zero. That's all it needs. Okay, it just needs a little starting point. Um, so the probability of winning um, every time you play this game is 0.38. All right, let's have a look at an example. Computer parts from a particular manufacturer are packed into boxes with each box containing 18 parts. If it is known that 85% of boxes have fewer than five defective parts, find correct to two decimal places, uh, the probability of a computer part from this manufacturer being def defective. Okay, so we need to set up our distribution first. So let's have D is going to be the number of defective parts. Okay, D is a binomially distributed variable. Um, each part is defective independent of any other um, and the probability of defect is um, constant for all parts. Um, so we need n and p. So boxes contain 18 parts, so n is 18. And the probability of a part being defective is unknown. That's what we're trying to work out. But what we do know is that the probability of there being fewer than five defective parts, so the probability d is less than five, um, is 85%. Okay. 
Now, obviously, less than you need to be a bit careful about with a discrete variable. So that's the same as the probability that D is less than or equal to 4. Sometimes it's a good habit to always rewrite with a less than or equal to, um, so that you're making sure you're putting the right information in your CAS. Okay, so we're going to be solving um, a menu 55B binom CDF. Number of trials is 18. Our probability is unknown. Our lower bound in this case, the D has to be less than or equal to 4. So lower bound is 0 and upper bound is 4, not 5. That's why it's helpful to rewrite this statement rather than just going with this. But you don't need to write this, but as long as you're careful about what you put in your CAS. Um, so if it's a discrete band and variable, less than 5 is the same as less than or equal to 4 because it can't be 4.2, for example. Um, and so we put our information in. Now, CAS won't like having the P in the binom CDF. But that's okay. Just ignore it. Um, so we want to solve that. We need that to equal 0.85. We want to solve that for P. And we will need to tell it outside of the solve function, given that P has to be bigger than 0. All right, and we want our answer correct to two decimal places, and so we find that P is approximately 0 0.16. So approximate the probability that a part is defective is approximately 0.16. So it's quite a high rate of defectivity, if that's a word. <laughs> okay, um, the other thing to note is that it is possible to be asked to find P in the tech-free paper, and the following examples should be answered without CAS. So it's also possible to solve these problems without your CAS, provided that the numbers work fairly nicely. Um, and these things do come up, as you'll see, example three is part of a um, extended response question um, from an exam. So let's have a look at this example first. A manufacturer of kettles has a process of randomly testing the kettles as they leave the assembly line to see if they're defective. Three kettles are selected and tested for defects. Let x be the binomial random variable that is the number of defective kettles, so that x is distributed binomially um, with n is 3 and p is unknown. Okay, so the setup has been done for us here. x has been defined, it's the number of defective kettles, and x is a binomial um, variable where n is 3 and p is unknown. Okay, so if the probability that x equals 0 is the same as the probability that x equals 1. So if the probability of there being no defective kettles is the same as the probability of there being one defective kettle, find the value of p, where p is a probability between 0 and 1. Okay, so probability of x equaling 0 is the same as the probability of x equaling 1. So we're going to need to use our understanding of the binomial distribution. So... Um, n is 3 in this case, so probability of x equals 0 is 3 choose 0. So probability of success, which is p, to the power of 0, and the probability of failure, which is 1 minus p, to the power of 3 minus 0, so 3. And we use our binomial formula on the right-hand side. 3 choose 1, p to the power of 1, 1 minus p to the power of 2 minus 1, sorry, 3 minus 1, which is 2. Okay, so we need... Again, it's it, because the numbers are quite small here, only um, n is only 3, um, we can actually simplify these things ourselves. So 3 choose 0, anything choose 0 is 1. p to the power of 0, anything to the power of 0 is also 1. So we only have 1 minus p cubed on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 3 choose 1 is 3. p to the power of 1 is p, so we've got 3p times 1 minus p all squared. Now, we could expand everything out and collect like terms, but we don't need to here. I'm going to divide both sides by 1 minus p squared, okay? And that's okay because 1 minus p can't equal 0, okay? Because p can't equal 1. So if it was possible that 1 minus p would equal 0, you can't divide by 1 minus p because there's a possibility that you're dividing by 0. Okay? But because we know that 1 minus p cannot equal 0, and that's because we know that p cannot equal 1, um, it is okay to divide by 1 minus p, and therefore it's also okay to divide by 1 minus p all squared because it can't be 0 either. So dividing both sides by 1 minus p all squared is going to leave us with 1 minus p here and 3p here. And so if we add p to both sides divide both sides by 4, we get that p equals 1 quarter. Okay, so completely tech-free. So please don't think that probability will only happen in the tech-active paper. 
uh, it is perfectly po be possible to be asked things in the tech free. Now, this example here does actually come from exam two, which was the tech active paper, but it was a show that question, and so you had to do the algebra by hand. I actually marked VCAR papers in this year, and there did need to be, you know, at least one or two lines of working between the initial statement and the um, final answer in order to earn the mark. After all, it is a show that question. Okay, so um, I've condensed the STEM information because it was like, this was like part D of a longer question. But essentially it was, uh, Jess has agreed to take part in a psychology experiment. She must answer several sets of 25 multiple choice questions. For each question, there are four possible options, A, B, C, or D, of which only one is correct. The probability that Jess will answer any question correctly, independent of her answer to any other question, is P, um, where P is between zero and one. Let the random variable Y be the number of questions that Jess answers correctly in any set of 25. Okay, so Y is defined as the number of questions that she answers correctly in any set of 25. We know that Y is a binomial variable, okay, because she answers the num uh, each question she answers independently of every other question, um, and it's a constant probability of P for every question that she'll get it correct. Um, so there's 25 questions, so N is 25 and P is unknown. The Y equals is defined for us, Y is the number of questions she answers correctly. So that bit's already done. I do this bit of the definition myself, um, and then we go with what we're doing here. So we're told the probability of y being bigger than 23 is equal to 6 times the probability that y equals 25. So the probability that she gets more than 23 out of 25 correct is equal to 6 times the probability that she'll get all 25 correct. Okay, so the probability that y is bigger than 23 is the probability of y equaling 24 plus the probability of y equaling 25. And we know that that equals 6 times the probability that y equals 25. So if I collect together these like terms by subtracting probability of y equals 25 from both sides, I actually find that the probability of y equaling 24 is equal to 5 times the probability that y equals 25. Okay, so the probability that she gets 24 out of 25 questions correct is, is five times the probability that she'll get all 25 out of 25 correct. Okay, so now let's set up our um, binomial distribution here. So we know we're going to have 25 choose 24, p to the power of 24, 1 minus p to the power of 1. And on this side we've got 5 times 25 choose 25, p to the power of 25 and 1 minus p to the power of 0. Okay, so let's tidy that up. 25 choose 24. Okay, so thinking about our Pascal's triangle, the edges are always 1. Okay, so 25 choose 0 would be 1 and 25 choose 25 will also be 1. And then one in one row in from that will equal 25. So this would be 25 choose 1 and 25 choose 24 will be the same thing. Okay, so that's going to be 25, because essentially the number of ways of choosing 24 things and 25 things is the same question as how many ways can I choose one thing to leave behind. Okay, so this is 25, p to the power of 24, 1 minus p. And on this side, 25 choose 25 is 1, so we've just got the 5 from there. Uh, p to the power of 25 and 1 minus p um, to the 0 is just 1. Okay, so let's maybe expand things out a bit. So we've got 25p to the 24 minus 25p to the 25 equals 5p to the 25. Let's take away that 5p to the 25. Okay, factorizing. So we can take out a nice common factor of 5p to the 24 and we get left with 5, oh, sorry, not 5p, just 5 minus uh, 6p. And so then null factor law tells us that either 5p to the 24 equals 0, so p equals 0, which is not possible because p is between 0 and 1, okay? Um, or 5 minus 6p equals 0, so 6p equals 5, so p equals 5 sixths. So therefore, 
since p has to be between 0 and 1, p must be equal to 5 sixths. Okay, so that was actually an exam question in 2012. That level of by hand and algebra work is going to be required. Okay. All right, that's finding P using CAS and also looking at some examples where you might need to use the binomial formula to do it by hand. Let's have a look at finding N if that's unknown, so the sample size. Let's have a look at um, the same kind of example. Um, so the probability of winning a prize in a game of chance is 0.45. What is the least number of games that must be played to ensure that the probability of winning a prize at least twice is more than 0.95? So again, let's focus on getting the setup right. So let W equal the number of times a prize is won. W is a binomially distributed variable. N is unknown. We don't know how many games to play. Okay, The least number of games, how many games should we play? Um, but P is 0.45. Probability of winning in any given game is 0.45. Now we know that the, we want the probability of winning a prize at least twice to be more than 0.95. So we need to interpret that into the maths. Probability that W is bigger than or equal to 2, so at least twice means 2 or more, has to be more than, so greater than 0.95. It's really important that you are specific about whether they're greater than or equal to or whether they're greater than, um, and that your answer is a direct interpretation of that. Your so working is a direct mathematical interpretation of that sentence. Okay, so there are a few different ways that we can answer this question. The first is to use the CAS's inverse binomial n function. And this is a relatively new function for the CAS. It's only been around for the last couple of years. Okay, It is a little bit fiddly in that you have to set things up completely correctly. So generally speaking, if x is distributed binomially, and n and p are the parameters, and the probability of um, the variable x being less than or equal to a particular value x is smaller than capital P or smaller than or equal to capital P. Okay, You do need to have a less than or equal to in here. Okay, But this can be less than or less than or equal to and it's going to give you the same result. We then can use inverse binomial n to find the value of n. And the syntax for n inverse binomial n is going to be this. It requires p which is that probability there. And it has to be less than or less than or equal to. So the first problem here is we've got this around the wrong way. Okay. Um, the next value is P, okay, which is the probability of success. So we'll generally have that. That's nice and easy. That's going to be 0.45 in this particular problem. And then the next value is X, which is this. Okay. And again, it has to be less than or equal to X. So our problem, we've got that greater than or equal to. So we need to reformulate the information that we've been given so that it is in this form or this form. Okay. So we want less than or equal to and less than or less than or equal to um, everywhere before we can then go to inverse binomial n with the correct values. Okay, so we must realise that if we know that the probability of w being bigger than or equal to 2 is this, is great, has to be greater than 0.95, well, w greater than or equal to 2 is the same as 1 minus the probability of w being less than 2. w less than 2 in a discrete um, variable is the same as the probability that w is less than or equal to 1. Okay. Um, and so then I can subtract 1 from both sides of this inequality, uh, which gets, gives this to negative uh, 0 0.05 and just loses that from there. And then we can multiply both sides of the inequality by negative 1, which means reversing the sign. So we now have that the, if the probability of W being greater than or equal to 2 is greater than 0.95, that is the same as the probability of W being less than or equal to 1 has to be less than 0.05. And that's the format we need for inverse binomial N. So now capital P will be 0.05, that's that value there. P, the probability of success in any given game, is still coming from up here, our original binomial distribution, that's 0.45. And x is 1. Okay, that's that value there. Oops, sorry. x is 1, which is that value there. Okay, and we put that in our CAS. So um, inverse binomial n, menu 5, 5. And if we scroll down here a little bit, we'll be able to see it. But as usual, we'll get used to the codes. So it's menu 5, 5. I'm oh, sorry. Slow reaction time on my CAS. Menu 5, 5d. So not c. We want inverse binomial n. 
the cumulative probability, okay, so that's why it has to go this way. It's got to be a cumulative probability, okay. Up to that point, the probability is 0 0.05, okay. So cumulative probability in this case is 0 0.05. The probability of success is 0.45 and the x value is 1. Now, if we just press OK, um, it'll tell us, it'll just give us 9, so n equals 9. Sometimes I like to, I just like to feel confident because rounding can sometimes be an issue here. Um, I just like to feel confident. So if I'd instead done it as menu 55D, cumulative prob 0 0.05, probability of success is 0.45, and number of successes. If I tick this matrix form, and press OK, it'll give me this little matrix which essentially calculates um, the probability for two different n values. So you can be 100% certain that it's rounded the right way. So we can see when n equals 8, this probability, the probability of w being less than or equal to 1 will be equal to 0 0.06, so that is not less than 0 0.05. Um, so the first time that n is actually, the probability is actually less than 0 0.05 is when n equals 9, okay? And the thing is, it's actually quite a lot less than 0 0.05, but it, this does allow you to ensure or to check that it is, when n equals 9, that is still the first value of n that gives a probability less than 0 0.05, um, which means going back to the original question, this probability will actually be greater than 0 0.95. So n equals 9. So in terms of the answer to this question, one must play at least nine times, play the game at least nine times to ensure that the probability of winning a prize at least twice is greater than 0.95. Um, generally speaking, I would say that inverse binomial n would these days be um, a preferred method, although um, previous to inverse binomial n being a, a function on the CAS, um, my preferred method would have been the second option, which is actually just a trial and error method. And I would say if you're dealing with relatively small numbers, this is still a relatively good method. Okay, So this is simply you just have a stab at what n might be. So if we go back to our original question, um, we're looking at this situation here. Okay, We want it to be bigger than 0.95. We've got our information here. So if I just go, okay, menu, uh, sorry, menu 55B uh, to do a cumulative probability. If I just guess, okay, let's say I have to play the game. Let me guess and see that I have to play the game five times to make sure that this happens. Probability of success is 0.45. I want to have at least two wins, so from two up and two. If I've made N five, then that upper bound will have to be five. And I want that probability to be bigger than 0.95. Okay, so I can see that it's not bigger than 0.95 when N equals five. And so then I can simply, I don't need to go through that whole process again. So all I did then was scroll up twice, press enter to copy that down, and I can change the fives. Let's see what happens when we play the game six times. Okay, getting better. Let's see what happens. Now, if you make a jump, let's say you go to, okay, it's going up slowly. Let me jump ahead a bit. Let me try nine games. And you go, oh, okay, that's bigger than 0.95. I'm done. Okay. Now you can't just, you can't just, assume that that is the smallest value of n. So I would then need to backtrack and check, okay, well, let me just check that um, 8, n equals 8 doesn't give a probability over 0.95 and I can be confident. Okay, so when n equals 8, the probability is 0.94. When n equals 9, the probability is 0.96. So n equals 9 is actually the first or the lowest value of n that will ensure the probability is bigger than 0.95. Now, the um, Trial and error method can actually be the most efficient method because you don't need to turn this around into this, okay? And so it actually can be quite efficient. But if you're looking at potentially quite big n values, you know, you might need to do 156 trials, you could be trialing and erroring for quite a while. So, you know, it's a bit of a, um, a bit of a judgment call, um, but it's worth having both methods in your pocket. The third method, which I wouldn't recommend unless we were in a tech-free paper, um, is to set up an equation and solve it. And this would only really be an option in a tech-free paper if it was quite a simple example. And so again, it's about using your um, binomial rule for the binomial um, probability um, to actually set up an equation. So we want to find n such that the probability of w being bigger than or equal to 2 is bigger than 0.95. Again, flipping that around into this statement makes it an easier equation to set up because probability of W being bigger than or equal to 2 is probability of W equals 2 plus probability of W equals 3 plus up 2 and we don't know what N is. So you want to flip it around the other way so you're dealing with a finite number of things. Okay, So probability that W equals 0 plus the probability that W equals 1 has to be uh, less than 
or equal to, um, sorry, that should be just less than, or it doesn't really matter, um, 0 0.05 because um, it's not likely to be exact anyway, so either way. Um, so using our formula, that's n to 0, 0.45 to the 0, 0.55 to the n, and our w equals 1 is n choose 1, 0.45 to the 1, and 0.55 to the n minus 1. So n choose 0 is 1, 0.45 to 0 is 1, so we just have 0.55 to the n. Uh, n choose 1 is n, 0.45 to the 1 is just 0.45, and 0.55 to the n minus 1. And so essentially, you've got an equation to solve. Now, with such a complex equation, your CAS won't cope with solving the inequality. So you get your CAS to solve the equation. So you can see that's what's happening here. Um, and it gives me two solutions for n, but n, it's got a negative n value. Now, n is the number of um, times you have to play the game. So uh, n has to be positive, so we can immediately rule out the negative solution. But then we need to think about the rounding. So n equals 8.47, so technically that rounds down to 8, but do we always need to round up? Personally, I wouldn't try to overthink it. I would then just calculate the binomial probabilities when n equals 8 and when n equals 9. Okay. So binom CDF when n equals 8 gives me a probability of 0.936, or sorry, rounded 0.937 or 0.94, um, and when n equals 9, I get my probability over 0.95. Um, so as I said, this is only going to work in a limited number of circumstances. If you had, you know, if you're looking at a probability bigger than or equal to 20, then even if you flip it around, that's W less than or equal to 19, you're looking at 20 different um, expressions being set up here. So it's a fairly niche example where you're going to be able to um, set up and solve an equation. So that would certainly be a last resort, but it's the sort of thing you need to be able to do as we saw in those previous examples where we were finding P in a tech-free paper. Um, so generally speaking, inverse binomial n um, or a trial and error method would be the way to go. Okay, so let's work through an example here. Um, the probability of a striker making a penalty shot is 0.6. If the striker takes five shots at goal, find correct to four decimal places, the probability that he makes every shot, he scores at least three goals. Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's set this up first. Um, so let's let x equal the number of shots scored. Okay, x is a binomial variable, n is uh, in part a, n is he takes 5 shots, so n is 5, and p is 0.6. Okay, so in a part 1, we want the probability that he makes every shot, so the probability that x is equal to 5, so when he takes 5 shots, he gets 5 successful shots. So menu 5, 5, now this is a binom PDF, a, because we're only finding one value n is 5, p is 0.6, and the x value is 5. Okay, correct to four decimal places, that's 0 0.0778. Just check that rounding actually. Sorry, I edited my settings here the other day to demonstrate something. I need to change them again. 0 0.0778, yep. Alright. Then part B, the probability that he scores at least three goals. Okay, so I don't need to rewrite this. It's exactly the same setup. So this time the probability that x is bigger than or equal to three. So at least three greater than or equal to. So make sure your interpretation is correct. Um, so menu 55B, five, five, number of trials is five. Probability of success is 0.6. Lower bound is going to be three. Upper bound will be, sorry, five. And so correct to four decimal places, that is 0.682. I'm just going to check that rounding. Ah, 0.6826. Okay, um, so this would probably be worth two marks, one for the setup and one for the answer here, whereas part B or part two would only be worth one because you've already done using the same setup as the previous question. All right, then part B, what is the smallest number of shots he must take to ensure a probability of 0.9 of making the shot at least twice? Okay, so here where he took five shots, that was just in part A. So that doesn't apply to part B. So in terms of reading a question, we read the stem and part B. Okay, so anything listed in within part A is relevant only to part A. Otherwise, it would have been listed in the stem if we wanted it to be used in part B. Okay, so... We need to be careful because we have set this up. X is still going to be the number of shots scored, so I don't need to change that. But this changes because n is no longer 5. So I'm just going to redo that bit. So x is now binomial, but we don't know what n is. 
probability of success is still 0.6. I don't need to rewrite out this sentence again because it's exactly the same sentence I'm carrying through the whole problem. Okay, we want to know the smallest number of shots, so we're trying to find n, okay, um, that he must take to ensure a probability of 0.9 of making the shot at least twice. So probability that he scores the shot at least twice, he wants to ensure a probability of 0.9, so it has to be greater than or equal to 0.9. Okay, so uh, 0.9 or more. You're ensuring a probability of 0.9 if you're getting 0.9 or more. Okay, so let's try using our inverse binomial n, but we need to be able to flip this around. So this is going to be the same as the probability of x being less than 2 has to be less than or equal to 0.1. Okay, so that is the probability that x is less than or equal to 1 has to be less than or equal to 0.1. Alright, so we've got our information we need for the inverse binomial n. Okay, in this case p is 0.1, lowercase p is the probability of success, that comes from the original distribution, that's 0.6, and x is 1. Okay, now that is purely CAS syntax there, I wouldn't be writing that down on the paper at all, I just do it. Okay, I'm just uh, making my thinking explicit for you. So menu 55D five, five, for inverse binomial n. Cumulative probability is 0.1. The probability of success in any given shot is 0.6. And the number of successes is up to and including 1. I'm going to tick the matrix form. I like to just see what the probabilities are. So we can see that um, the probability is first less than 0.1 when n equals 5. Okay. So therefore, um, he must take... five shots um, in order to ensure a probability of 0.9 of making the shot at least twice. Alright, example two. Joe is a long jump champion and he's found that he can jump more than 6.5 me metres on 30% of his jumps. How many jumps would he have to make to ensure that the probability of jumping more than 6.5 metres at least once is more than 85%? It's very easy to get bogged down in all of the more than, at least, more than information here. So really break it down. What is your variable? What do you know? And what are you trying to find? Okay. Um, so it's all about the number of times you can jump more than 6.5 meters. Okay. So let's let x is going to be the number of jumps. It doesn't have to be x. You can call it whatever you want. Number of jumps over 6.5 meters. Okay. X is a binomially distributed variable. We don't know how many jumps, so we're trying to find n. n is unknown, um, but the probability that he jumps over 6.5 meters is 30% on any of his jumps. Okay, so on 30% of his jumps, so 0.3 is going to be our probability of success on any given jump. How many jumps would he have to make to ensure that the probability of jumping more than 6.5 meters at least once? So the probability that x, which is when he jumps over 6.5 meters, is uh, at least once, so greater than or equal to 1, has to be more than 0.85. Okay. Alright, so again, we're going to need to flip this around to use inverse binomial n. So this is the same as the probability of x being less than 1, has to be less than 0.15. So less than 1 is just probability x equals 0, has to be less than 0.15, which is the same as x being less than or equal to 0. Okay, same thing. Alright, so again, we've got our x value is 0, our capital P value is 0.15, and lowercase p is 0.3. So menu 55d, five five inverse binomial n, our cumulative probability is 0.15, our probability of success on any given jump is 0.3, x is 0. Again, if we have a look at the matrix form, we can see that when he takes 5 jumps, um, the probability will be 0.16, which is not less than 0.15, and so he's going to need to take 6 jumps. The n would be 6 or more um, in order to ensure the probability is less than 0.15 and therefore how many jumps would he have to make? Um, he must take 6 jumps. 6 or more jumps. Okay, so it doesn't say what is the least number of jumps he needs to make, so just how many jumps. So whereas this one up here, it was what is the um, 
smallest number of shots. The smallest number of shots is five. If he took more than five shots, he's also going to meet this probability requirement, but it did ask for the smallest number of shots, where here it is how many jumps would he need to make. So he would need to make six or more jumps, and, and the probability condition would be met. Um, if you wanted to do trial and error here, you know, just menu 5.5b, five, five, um, have a guess. We know now that the answer is 6, but let's say we try and see what happens when he has 4 jumps. Uh, probability of success is 0.3 and he wants to get at least 1 over 6.5 metres. And we can see, okay, well that's not at 85% yet. Um, if we see what happens when he does, I'm oh, sorry, to make that 5. If he has 5 jumps, okay, 83%, we're getting close. Let's see what happens at 6 jumps. Yes, 88% chance. Okay, um, last example here, um, you'll recall if you, uh, in the earlier video, previous videos, looked at the number file video about rolling a one roll Yahtzee. Um, he claimed, Brady claimed that he would have to roll the dice 2,920 times in order to ensure a 90% probability of rolling a Yahtzee. Actually, if you roll the dice 2,920 times, you have an 89.5017 chance of rolling a Yahtzee. So you remember we worked out the probability of success here was 1 on 1296. Um, and so we can verify that if we have a look at menu 55B. Five, five, um, so if N was 2920, the probability of success is 1 on 1296. The lower bound, uh, what are we doing? To ensure a probability roll, you see, wants to roll at least one Yahtzee in those rolls. We actually find there's the probability 0.895017, so he's not actually quite at 90%. Um, so how many times would you need to roll the dice to ensure a probability of at least 90%? Okay, so X is the, let's do Y this time. Uh, y is the number of one roll Yahtzees. Um, y is binomial. We're trying to work out how many rolls should we make if the probability of success is 1, 2, 9, 6. We want to know the probability of rolling at least one one roll Yahtzee has to be at least 90%. Okay, so this is the same as the probability of Y being less than or equal to 0 is um, less than or equal to 0.1. So in terms of inverse binomial n, then you 55d, cumulative probability is 0.1, probability of success is 1 on 1296, and 0 is our x value. And we find that n has to be bigger than or equal to 2983. So he actually needs to roll the dice 2,983 times to ensure at least a 90% probability. Okay, yes, this rounds to 90%, the nearest percent. Um, but in terms of you know answering the question um, being framed, it's actually quite a big jump when we're doing that many rolls and when the probability is um, that small. Okay, so the work today, mostly from exercise 14C, but they have focused on finding N. Uh, there's a couple of additional questions in a worksheet uh, that allow you to practice finding P.